Welcome to the Ocean International Community Church. We're going to have some church this morning. Somebody say amen. I am excited about the message today. I'm excited to continue and to bring to conclusion our sermon series on the questions of Christ this morning. It has been a really great, great series. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Matthew chapter 9 and just a quick review as we move into week number three, talking about the questions of Christ. We realize that Jesus asked so many questions in his earthly ministry. In fact, Jesus probably asked as many questions as he made statements because sometimes questions are better teachers than statements. Sometimes the things that teach us the most are questions. And and we looked at a powerful question in week number one and it said, who do you say that I am? And Jesus looked at his disciples and and he asked that question, Who do you say that I am? And we know Peter's response was, you are Jesus. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus' response to him was, surely this is not something that you were taught by man, but you have learned only from the Lord. And our takeaway on that day was, or a true declaration is evidenced by true dedication. If we're going to proclaim that he is the Messiah, we must live our lives accordingly. Amen? Amen. The second week we talked about the simple question, do you love me? Do you love me? And that question was asked again of Peter and drove Peter to remember a few things in his life, to remember the beginning of when Jesus called him into relationship with him and to follow him. It caused Peter to remember all of the miraculous things that he had witnessed in his relationship with Jesus. In those moments when we wonder about our relationship with Jesus, all we have to do is go back and remember the beginning and the feelings that we felt when we entered into that fresh new relationship with Jesus and remember all of the mighty things that he has done. And it forced Peter to also remember the grace of Jesus when Jesus removed for Peter all evidence of wrongdoing in his life. Somebody say amen. Amen. Are you glad he's done that for you today? Come on. And uh, do you love me? Well, I don't know if I do, Jesus. Well, remember. Remember the beginning. Remember how it felt when we first started. Remember how it felt when you first started dating? Some of you couples been married a little less than about three or four years. You remember what it was like when you first started dating? Yeah, I'm looking right at you. You know who I'm talking to. <laughs> remember those feelings inside, you know? Jesus is saying, Peter, remember the beginning? You remember all the great things I've done sometimes in our relationship with Jesus? When we begin to doubt, we need to remember all the great things he has done. Amen. We need to remember his grace. And the last thing is we have to remember the purpose that he's given us. Jesus reinforced his purpose for Peter when he asked him, do you love me? Because if you love me, then I need you to remember what I've called you to do. I need you to remember the purpose and the plan that I have set for you and for your life. Remember, Peter. Now, this morning, we're going to enter into another question that I think is really really a question that everybody deals with because there there comes a time in life probably more than once it has for me it will for you when your faith is really tested i mean when your faith in jesus is really put to the test i want to read a story to you out of matthew chapter 9 just two short verses three short verses this morning matthew chapter 9 We'll begin reading at verse 27. It says this, As Jesus went from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And when he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him. And he asked them, Do you believe? that I am able to do this. 
They hadn't even asked for anything yet except for mercy. Can I tell you this morning that Jesus already knows what you need before you ask? They hadn't even asked. But as we read the story, it's kind of obvious what they're going to ask for. He said, do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your Not according to my ability. It wasn't a matter of whether or not Jesus could or couldn't. Jesus can and will always be able to. But what he says is, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was Restore Jesus this morning. Restore our faith. Strengthen our faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. How many times have we been guilty of making requests of Jesus but really doubting that he can do what we ask? How many times have we gone before Jesus Asking for big things, maybe even small things, but really doubting that he will do it, hear it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? We do it because we're supposed to. That's what you do. You take your needs to Jesus. But do you really believe that he can do this? There's many reasons for this. Maybe there's been things we've asked and it hasn't come to pass. Maybe our faith is weakened by doubt or fear. Maybe our faith has been weakened simply because of the distance between us and Jesus. Distance will decrease our faith. It will cause us to doubt. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to faith. You know, the greatest tragedy in the life of a believer is not that they don't read their Bible. The greatest tragedy in the life of a follower of Jesus is is not the fact that they don't pray. The greatest tragedy in the life of the believer is, is not that they stop attending church on a regular basis. I mean, those are tragic, trust me. But they're not the greatest tragedy. The reality this morning is the greatest tragedy for any believer is to simply lose their faith. If we lose our faith, we lose everything. The Bible is very clear about the importance of faith in the walk of the believer. It's very important about how powerful and how important faith is for our lives. We know that in Hebrews 11.1 1, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now we read that in scripture and we know the Bible says that and the Bible says that we're supposed to believe it. But the reality is that's really hard to believe. Stop and read that one more time with me this morning. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. That's not so difficult. That's not so hard. We can be sure of what we hope for. That's gonna, I know it's going to happen. I want that. I hope this happens. I'm I'm sure of it. I hope it happens. I'm sure of it. But it's the second part of that scripture that's very difficult for us. Certain of what we do not see. It's interesting that we share that verse this morning because the story that we're looking at has to deal with people who cannot Can it be said of you this morning that you are certain of what you do not see? How many of you this morning have been asking God for something for a long time, but have yet to see it come to pass? How many of you have lost faith that it will happen because you don't see it? Raise your hand. Don't lie. (laughs) It's easy to lose faith. When we cannot see. 
But faith is just that. Faith is just that. According to Scripture, it's being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Hebrews 11.6 says this, says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Can I encourage you this morning a, a little outside of class reading for this week? Go read Hebrews 11. This week, read Hebrews 11, Hebrews 12. Chapters about faith. I, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Have you ever wondered why that is? I have. Does that mean when I don't believe God's mad at me? Absolutely not. I do not believe that at all. Though some people might preach that. But what I do believe is this, is that in order for us to accomplish and to achieve those things that God has for us to accomplish and to achieve, it's going to require great faith. Because God's not just going to want us to accomplish things we can do on our own. He's a bigger God than that. So the things that he puts in order for our lives are things that are going to require him to be a part. And if it's going to require him to be a part, it's going to require a measure of faith. And so if we're going to accomplish God's purpose in our lives and please him, then we have to have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And some of you are like, well, Pastor Jimmy, I, I don't even have much faith. I got good news for you this morning. It doesn't take much faith. In fact, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20 says, Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed. Anybody ever seen a mustard seed? Huh? Anybody ever seen a mustard seed? I mean, it's about the size of that little piece of food that gets stuck in between your teeth when you're eating dinner. You know what I'm talking about? Let's just be honest. I know everybody's like, that's gross, Pastor Jimmy. But I mean, think of something that small. That's the first thing I could think of. So I just, it's how my mind works. You know, when you're like eating chicken, and it's like, <laughs> and you get that toothpick. Because I, if you don't want anybody to know you're picking your teeth, that's, what else are you doing? <laughs> the size of a mustard seed. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. Everybody say nothing. nothing. Look at your neighbor, say nothing. nothing. Now, don't say it so proper. Just say nothing. Nothing, because nobody says nothing. <laughs> What's wrong with you, nothing? <laughs> we say nothing, N-U-T-H-I-N, ain't nothing wrong. <laughs> nobody says, nothing's wrong with me, Mom. <laughs> nothing. What's up with you, nothing? Nothing is impossible. I want you to read that again this morning. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, Nothing is impossible. You can say to that mountain, move, and that mountain will move from here to there if you have faith the size of a mustard seed. You know, and we read that, and it's like, shoot, that should be easy, but how many of us still battle with faith? <laughs> Even though we know the Bible says faith the size of a mustard seed is all we need, but yet we have a hard time even finding that sometimes. I want to help you with that this morning. I want to give you four keys to growing your faith this morning. Jesus looked at these blind men as they were coming in to meet him, and he says, do you believe I am able to do this? The reality this morning is that faith is like a muscle. If we will exercise it, it will grow, but if we never use it, it will die. We, we call that atrophy. 
when our muscles begin to dwindle because we don't use them. We, we call that atrophy. And the problem with many believers today is we deal with the level of spiritual atrophy where our faith is so small we've stopped believing God for anything. And maybe even today, maybe this is the morning where you become challenged to, to begin to work out your faith and, and begin to believe God for something that maybe you've stopped believing him for. I pray this is the case. And we realize that these, these blind men had just been around and just heard where Jesus had performed a miracle. Jesus had just raised the dead girl. Now, they obviously didn't see it because they were blind, but they heard the news. They heard about what Jesus had done. And with their courage, can can you imagine? They can't see Jesus, so it's not like they can walk up to him and tap him on the shoulder and say, Jesus. What do they do in the middle of the crowd? They yell. They scream. Jesus, Jesus, they yell his name, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Could you be that courageous today? Would you be that courageous today? Four keys to growing our faith. Number one, we must surround ourselves with faith-filled friends. Do the people you surround yourself with have faith? Are you surrounding your people with, are you surrounding yourself with people of faith? Do the people you surround yourself with drain you? Or fill you? Do your friends drain you? Or do they fill you? I cannot push this hard enough with people that your friends will define who you are. You will not be a world changer if you do not surround yourself with world changers. You will not continue to follow Jesus unless you surround yourself with those who... You will not continue to follow Jesus if you're dating or in a relationship with someone who does not That's Pam's getting the glory. (laughs) But some of you in this room are living testimonies to that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) If you need prayer right now, just stand. We'll We'll just address this issue right about now. Why wait, right? Why put off for tomorrow what you could do today? If we want to increase our faith, we have to surround ourselves with faith-filled friends, with people who have even greater faith than we do. If you want to be around God and miracles, then get around people who believe a God of miracles. You want to grow in your relationship with Jesus, then start hanging around those people who have a better relationship with Jesus than you do. Do your friends drain you or do they fill you? You got to avoid negative people. We, we have this saying in America that says if, if you want to soar with the eagles, you got to get off the ground with the turkeys. And so many of us look up in the sky and we wish we could soar like the eagles. But we're trapped on the ground following a bunch of dumb turkeys. If you want to increase your faith, surround yourself with faith-filled friends. Both of these men were blind, but yet they fed off of each other. I believe their faith encouraged one another. 
That's why they had the courage to yell out for Jesus. That's why they had the courage to enter into the house where he was. It was their faith that healed them. They refused to hear the negativity of the crowd. They chose to believe that Jesus could heal them. Your friends will define you. Number two, submerge yourself in the word. Surround yourself with faith-filled people. Number two, submerge yourself in the word. Romans 10, 17 tells us, So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You see, it's the word of God that really waters our faith. It's the word of God that nourishes us and refreshes us. And the more you get involved in the Word of God, the deeper you go into the Word of God, the deeper your faith roots will grow. Because the water, the the Word of God is, is, is like water to our soul. David even wrote, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. The Word of God is like a water that nourishes our faith that refreshes our faith in those times when our faith is small and, and our relationship may feel dry, we, we dive into the Word of God and it begins to refresh in us, it begins to nourish us, and it begins to cause our roots to grow deep. You know why so many people fall away from Jesus? Woo! They have no roots. The roots are dead. Why? Because they've not watered them. They've not nourished them. And the word of God is like refreshment and nourishment to the roots of our relationship, the roots of our faith. When we begin to read the word of God, the word of God reads us and it gets deep down inside of us and and begins to nourish our relationship with the Lord. Begins to push down into our root system where we continue to build a firm foundation If we want to grow in our faith, we must submerge ourselves in the word of God. We must desire to grow roots. Surround yourself with faith-filled friends. Submerge yourself in the word. Number three, submit yourself to prayer. Do you guys know that we have prayer meetings once a month called Catalyst Prayer? Do you know when it is? When is it? Huh? The first Saturday. I'm just asking because I don't see too many of you there. I'm just making sure you remember. If we're going to be people, if I, sometimes I think, Lulu, we don't believe because we don't pray. You cannot follow Jesus where Jesus wants to take you if you do not pray. Because where he takes you is going to require prayer. Period. Some of you, your biggest struggle is prayer. You can't see it because you can't pray it. You can't understand it because you don't pray it. You're not experiencing it because you won't pray it. But if we're going to be people of faith, then we have to submit ourselves to the spiritual discipline of prayer. Prayer causes our faith to flourish. The Word of God nourishes our faith, but prayer flourishes our faith. The word of God will nourish our faith, but prayer is causes our faith to flourish. The reality this morning is sometimes we have to believe beyond the obstacles. There are times when our blindness is a blessing. Because if we saw it all, we definitely would not believe it all. If we truly saw what God was going to make us walk through, we wouldn't even walk through it. We would run away from it. If we knew the cost it was going to cost us to get from point A to point B, we probably would just run away and never even consider paying it. Sometimes our blindness is a blessing. Sometimes what we cannot see is a good thing. Sometimes we just have to trust God, even though we don't see the full picture. 
Even though we can't see the complete story, sometimes we just have to trust him from chapter to chapter. Anybody like those shows that you're watching, like those weekly series? Most people don't do them every week. They do them in a binge now, and they watch like a whole season of shows in two days. A bunch of Netflix binge watchers. Hey, I'm guilty. I can't lie. <laughs> so we don't have to wait anymore. But, you know, the worst thing you can read at the end of a show is to be continued. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? But yet sometimes the Lord challenges us to live in a place that says to be continued. Why? Because he's growing our faith. I can't see the next chapter. I I don't understand it. But I'm praying, Lord. And I'm trusting. I'm praying, Lord. I'm praying, Lord. I'm praying, Lord. I can't see it. I don't know it. I don't understand it. But I believe in you and I trust you. To be continued. Faith. Do you believe that I can do this for you? Submit yourself to prayer. Submit yourself to prayer. Surround yourself with faith-filled friends. Submerge yourself in the word. Submit yourself to prayer. And number four, spend time in his presence. Nobody has more faith than Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. Time in his presence will result in a life full of his presence. Time in his presence will result in a life full of his presence. There are gifts to be received in the presence of God that you will not receive if you're not with him. When I was a college student, About 30 and none of your business how many years ago. (laughs) I went to college away from mom and dad. Back then there wasn't really online banking and there wasn't a way to transfer money from one account to another account. Banking wasn't quite there yet. I used to love to go back home because I knew when I got in the presence of mom and dad, there would be presence. Dad would always give me that fatherly hug with a very healthy handshake before I left the house. Do you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) I didn't even care about the hug. I was a dumb young man. Dad, just shake my hand, bro. We're good. Just shake my hand. Or mom, because my mom, she... Now, when my, when, my, when my dad was lying on his deathbed, he looked at my brother and I and said, Boys, you better watch your mama. Well, obviously, Dad will take care of her for you. No, you don't understand, boys. Your mama will give away everything she has if you don't watch her. They should have nothing to live on. That was the heart of my mom. She was a generous woman. And mom... She would always just pull you back in the back bedroom when dad wasn't looking. And she'd go back to her little mama stash. Because mama have hiding places, right? Everybody knows mama's got hiding places. She'd go back to her mama stash and grab a little money and say, now, son, I love you. Don't tell your dad. (laughs) And I'm like, cool. And then we walk out to the driveway about to leave, and dad's like, I love you, son. And I'm like, cool. Because I knew if I was in their presence, I would get presents. (laughs) But Jesus is like that. If we'll spend time in his presence, it will be incredible how many presents our life will begin to have. Jesus is the father and the giver of all good things. And the Lord wants to give us good gifts. If, If... 
If our earthly parents desire to give us good gifts, how much more does our heavenly Father desire to give us good gifts? That's biblical. But he can only do that when we choose to be in his presence. And if we want to increase our faith and we want to see those things that we're praying for or those things that we're asking him for, we we got to be willing to spend time in his presence. He's not a drive-by Jesus. He's not drive through Jesus. But he wants you to stop and he wants you to come in and he wants you to commune with him and he wants to eat with you and he wants to visit with you and he wants to talk with you. He wants to be with you. And if you will choose to be in his presence, you will be blown away by his presence. Your faith will explode because you realize that nothing is impossible with Jesus. Do you believe that I am able to do this? Jesus is all-knowing. Jesus is all-powerful. He is all-sufficient. I, I like that old song we used to sing. I mean, it's corny now. We, we wouldn't sing it in church unless you were somewhere in the deep south where they still sing songs from back in 1953 or something. I mean, we used to sing that song, Look What the Lord Has Done. And it was like a Sunday night revival song. We would jump up and down and dance. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. You everybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever heard that song? Or is that like a really American song? But we used to sing it all the time in church. And the reality is if we, will, if we will begin to spend time in his presence, that will be our theme song. Look what the Lord has done. We would have never believed it. There is no way he could do that. But one day we're going to look back and say, look what the Lord has done. I got news for you. When them jokers were looking at the walls of Jericho all laid down on the ground in rubble, look what the Lord has done. When they were crossing that water with Moses and they look back and all the Egyptians are going. (laughs) Look what the Lord has done. So one day. We're going to look back and say. "Ah, Look what the Lord has done. But it's going to require. That we surround ourselves with faith-filled friends, and that we submerge ourselves into the Word of God and submit ourselves to prayer, and we choose to spend time in His presence. My question for you today is, are you willing to call out to Him even when you can't see Him? Are you willing to believe in Him even though you don't see His hand moving? Are you willing to call out to Him when you can't hear His voice speaking? Do you believe that he can do this? Would you be willing to follow Jesus into the unknown? The two blind men were. They couldn't even see the house they were walking into. They just knew Jesus was there. So they followed. Would you be willing to follow Jesus into the unknown? Is your faith that strong? Do you believe he is able to do this? Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you for questions. They've challenged us, Lord. Who do we say that you are? Do we love you this morning? Do we believe that you can? God, these are questions that should stir us to the core of our being in our walk with you. And This morning, Lord, as we are reading about faith, I know that there are some in this place this morning, Lord, who have great requests that they've laid at your feet. Some things requiring a miracle. 
God, we pray for them today. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, maybe you're here and you'd say, Pastor Jimmy, I, I've been praying for something for a long time and it's not come to pass. And I'd be honest with you, I'm really losing faith. I, I don't see Jesus. I don't hear Jesus. And I really need your prayers. If that's you this morning, I want you to stand up right where you're at. If that's you this morning, I want you to stand right where you are. It could be that you're here this morning and right now you're in the middle of a storm or you're in the middle of a battle and you don't see the answer and you don't feel Jesus and your faith is weak. But you need a right now Jesus for a right now situation that you can't fix on your own and you need a miracle today. If that's you in the place, I want you to stand this morning. If you're here today and you need a right now miracle in your life. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to believe together today. Here's what I want you to do. Those of you that are sitting, I want you to open your eyes and I want you to look around you. And if there is somebody standing next to you, I want you to stand with them and I want you to lay your hands on them. And we're going to pray for each other this morning. We're just going to make this house a house of prayer today. Amen. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of miracles. We thank you that you are a God who can do anything and that nothing is impossible for you. And, and Lord, we come together this morning with those who are standing and we pray, God, that you would increase their faith today, Lord. We pray that you would impart a measure of faith inside of their heart, inside of their soul, inside of their spirit this morning, God, that will give them, Lord, the opportunity to believe that you are able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. God, I pray that you would strengthen their faith in you today. I pray, Lord, that through this story, God, through this message, that, Lord, their faith would be stirred, God, and that they would begin to believe again. God, help them to believe again that you are able. Help them to believe again, Lord, that nothing is impossible for you. And God, we lift up every need that's represented by those who are standing today. And we ask you, God, to meet it. Be God of the miracle today. Jesus, come in and do what nobody thinks you can do. Come in, Lord, and do what's not yet been done. Come in and do what is only possible for you to do. Father, we lift our church family to you this morning and we pray for them. Would you be the God of the impossible? Would you be Jesus of miracles this morning? Help us to believe that you can do this. We thank you, Lord. We praise you today. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. <laughs>